chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we'll be reading from verse 24 down to verse 34. Before we begin, I, I want to say um, a hearty thank you to all of you who served in VBS. It was an incredible week. Um, for those of you that weren't there, your elders dressed up. I don't know if you know that. Um, got on the level with the young people and, and showed them Jesus. And uh, as I said at the, our VBS closing, what, what we're about at this church is uh, multi-generational thinking. How can we not just impact this generation for Christ, but generations to come? And all of you had a part in that by giving, by praying, by serving, and praise the Lord for it. It was an, uh, a tremendous outpouring of um, effort and talent and gifts of God's people pouring in to uh, little children. And uh, we'll only have to wait until we get to heaven to see uh, all the fruit that was born out of that. So I want to thank you very much. If you remember, uh, another thing I have to say, uh, if you remember a few weeks ago, I think it's about a few weeks ago, I asked you all to send me in, I asked you all a question, I asked you to send me in your responses. Um, what is one sentence that you can give about Christianity in the shortest number of words but the most amount of information, right? What is one, like if you could give it to the next generation, what's that one statement that you would give to the next generation in the shortest amount of words, but gives the most information? And I, I wanted to get in as many responses, and all of them were fantastic. I'm not just saying that because I'm a pastor and I don't want people to feel bad. They, they really all were. They, were all, they really were all very good. But at the end of the day, I... Um, this one struck me, and it's by our, our elder, Scott Kennedy. I don't know if he's here. Is Scott here? Oh, there he is. Yeah, Scott, Scott gave this answer. He said, God created, man fell, Christ redeems, restores, and perfects by his spirit. And it was a wonderful statement because it encapsulates the Trinity, creation, fall, and redemption. It also encapsulates the work of our justification and sanctification. And so I am very much thankful for that answer. That I, I thought that answer was fantastic, and many of you uh, also gave fantastic answers. And I'm going to ask Marsha to compile them and send them out so you can have an opportunity to read all of them. And now uh, let's turn to our, our passage. We've been doing a series on contentment, contentment. And um, we looked at the first week, contentment from above. Then we looked at contentment from within. Um, contentment from above, we looked at the reality that we are um, supposed to rest in Christ like a weaned child. Contentment from within, meaning that we need to learn contentment. And now contentment from without, uh, God has placed things around us to show us what contentment looks like, namely the birds and the lilies. So let's look at this passage, this wonderful passage. I want to begin at Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 24, and then I'm going to read down to verse 34. Hear now the word of the Lord. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lily lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, or you of little faith? 
Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Well, all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that will be taught unto you. Amen and amen. Well, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, indeed, this is your word, and these are your people. I pray that now you might grant us faith to believe and trust fully in you. Bless us now, O Lord. Comfort us with your word, because these are your words, not mine. Lodge them deeply in the heart of your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You might have heard the story. Uh, I don't think it's a true story, but uh, you never know. You might have heard the story of the man who was afraid to fly. He was in the airport. He was anxious and pacing up and down. After a few moments, he observed a machine that sells life insurance. So he goes up to the machine, he checks it out, and he looks and he sees that it's actually very cheap life insurance. And so he bought some. Thought if anything happens, uh, I could provide for my family. So with life insurance in hand, he starts walking around and then he gets hungry. And so he finds a Chinese uh, eatery, because he likes Chinese, apparently, and he sits down and he eats his meal. He takes the fortune cookie, breaks it open, and it reads, a recent investment that you have just made will soon pay off. (laughs) There's always something to be anxious about, isn't there? And that's because we live in anxious times. We really do. I I don't know if you've been paying attention, but the stock market is collapsing. Inflation is high. Gas is high. And from everything I've read and seen, we're headed towards a recession. And some of you are looking at me, Pastor, I wasn't anxious before you said that, but definitely now I am. Well, I wouldn't blame you. There's a lot to be anxious about. Most of you know that we run a food network, and I I praise the Lord for the generosity of this church in providing for the people in the food network. Without your generous giving, consistent giving, there's no way we could provide for those people. But I could tell you over the last two months, I've seen person after person come in anxious about not, not stuff just food. There was a lady that came this week, and and she was talking to us. Me and Marcia sat down with her, and we prayed with her, and the whole time we were talking to her, she was anxious. She was worried if she was going to provide for her children. How could she provide for her children? She was filled with anxiety. Now, let me say this. The Bible mentions two kinds of anxiety. One is the good form of anxiety, and the other is the bad form of anxiety. The good form of anxiety that the Bible mentions is actual concern and care for the needs of others and ourselves. That's appropriate. This woman that came to us, she was concerned for her children. That's that's a good thing. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 25 that we ought to be anxious for one another and our needs. If there is someone in here that has a need, we ought to move heaven and earth to provide for them because that's what the church does. In the same way, when people come to us to the food network, we try to move heaven and earth to provide for their regular needs because they desperately need it. That's a good form of concern. You should have concern for your family and for your children and for others. 
Because that's what the gospel calls us to. That's the good form of concern. But the Bible also speaks about a bad form of anxiety. And that's what's in this passage. Notice Jesus says six times not to be anxious. He says, do not be anxious about your life. Verse number 25. And he says, and which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? Verse number 27. In verse number 28, he says, why are you anxious about clothing? Verse number 31. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying what you shall eat or drink or wear. Verse number 31. And in verse number 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Over and over again, Jesus is calling us and talking to us about the bad form of anxiety. And the reason why it's a bad form of anxiety is because it is the form of anxiety that robs you of your contentment and trust and provision in the Lord God Almighty. That's what's being said here over and over again. Now, let me say this. I, I wish... You could, we could discern the tone of this passage. It's hard when you read a Bible passage to discern the tone of this passage. But I could promise you, as Jesus is saying these things, he's not berating us. He's not beating us down. He's not saying, how foolish are you to even be anxious? No, Jesus understands that you and I need food and clothing. He understands that we have tremendous concerns. And the reason why Jesus understands these things is because he needed them himself. Do you all realize that Jesus was an actual human being? He had real needs. And so what he's talking about here isn't something that's completely outside of his experience. Jesus knows 100% that you and I need things. One of the most glorious verses in the Bible is found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4, verse 15, when he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Think of the glorious reality of that passage, that Jesus understands that we have needs. He understands that. He knows that. So he's not berating us. But Jesus at the same time is telling us there is a form of anxiety that causes us to lose trust and reliance on God. In fact, that's the context of verse number 24. Notice what it says. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, in, the, in your Bible, the word money there, uh, some of you have mammon. Anybody have mammon in their Bible? A few of you do. The word mammon doesn't actually mean money. It means that which you place your trust in. And what Jesus is saying here that's so profound is that for you and I, the question is, what are we going to put our trust in? Are we going to put our trust in money and in things? Are we going to put our trust severely in the Lord? Now, the glorious aspect of this passage on anxiety is that Jesus is trying to persuade us to put our trust in the Lord. That's the point. That's the whole point of this passage. He's trying to persuade us over and over again. He uses about seven, some say nine arguments to try and convince us. That God, that we should put our trust in God and we should rest in God. Uh, let me tell you this. There is going to come a point in our, in our life and even now where you need to be persuaded to put your trust in God fully and completely. I, I, most of you don't know this, but there was a time in my life where I was deathly afraid of water. I mean, I wouldn't go in the water. You might say, well, Pastor Dennis, you lived on an island seven by 21. Yes. So you could imagine what hell I was in for a long period of my life. You put me in water and I started to sweat and shake. And I became terribly anxious. Now, you know what's interesting to me? God never took away the anxiety of water. Instead, he provided a friend who helped me by giving me arguments for why I shouldn't be afraid of water. 
In fact, I went out with my friend, and he would tell me, Dennis, if you just hold your breath and stay still, you will float to the top. You know what he didn't do? He said, by the power of God, get rid of their anxiety. Because he knew that would be pointless. You see, the whole point that Jesus is doing here, that the brilliance of what Jesus is doing here is this. Jesus doesn't take away our anxiety. He, give us, he gives us a, greatest motivation, a greater motivation to live. And the greater motivation to live in this passage is to live for Christ, to love Christ. And so you might struggle with anxiety your whole life. And Jesus will never take that away. But the beauty of the gospel is that even though he doesn't take away your anxiety, he gives you a method to still live and persevere in your anxiety. And that's what he's doing here. It's called persuasion and argumentation. And this is something about Christianity that I think unbelievers miss. They think that we just operate by blind faith. Pray the anxiety away. But that's not what Jesus is doing here. If Jesus wanted to, he could have prayed the anxiety away. He could have taken it away, but he didn't do that. He actually gave us arguments because that's what Christianity does. It gives us reasons to live, reasons to walk in this world, reasons to exist. That's what this is. Now, we don't have the time to go through all of the arguments, but I want to lump them up into three arguments. And here they are, the first argument that Jesus uses in this passage. Remember, he's saying you could either serve God or you could serve money, mammon. You could either put your trust in God or you could put your trust in things. And here he gives us about seven arguments for why we should put our trust in God. But for the sake of time, I'm going to lump them into three. Here's the first one. Jesus says, or Jesus gives an argument for the, from the greater to the lesser. The greater to the lesser. Notice with me in verse number 25. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Notice, notice the application that he's making there. Notice the contrast. The contrast is between our life and food, body and clothing. And he's asking you, which one is more valuable? Now, reason tells us that the body and life is way more valuable, and so does our experience. Let me ask you a question. If there was a big fire in your home, and, and you had to decide between your children or their clothing, which one would you choose? Now, you might say, Pastor Dennis, that's a silly question. Of course it is. Uh, how many of you, if there's a huge fire, you'll say, oh, my goodness, I need to save the clothing and the food? And leave your children behind. You wouldn't do that because you know that your child's life is more important. If you're single in here, you wouldn't say, you know what, I need to rush back in and save my clothing. No, if you're outside, you'll save your own life because you understand that a life is way more important than food and clothing. So with that logic in place, here's what Jesus is saying. Then why do you pursue after clothing and food at the expense of your own soul. Why would you choose, why would you choose to go after things that are of no true value? Why do you obsess over things that are unable, that you are unable to be in relationship with? Let me actually turn this illustration around for a bit. Let's say for a moment there was a big fire and your children were on the inside, and you grabbed all of their clothing and all of their food and ran outside and left them in there, and, then, and they died. Now, children, your parents wouldn't do that, so calm down, right? But let's pretend for a moment, let's imagine for a moment that's what you did. Let me ask you this question. Could you have a relationship with clothing, their clothing? No. I remember when my mother died. Um my brother and I had to take her clothing. And, and I remember I took the clothing, and my mother uh, had one perfume that she always wear, Anais, Anais. From a child, she wore Anais, Anais. And Anais, Anais was all over her clothing. And I remember smelling it, and I remember crying because I remember her 
And I remember all the experiences that came with using with her using Anais Anise. But no matter how strong the experience, no matter how real it was to me, do you know who were not who was not in that clothing? My mother. And I would have wanted her way more than the clothing. And Jesus is telling us, he's using this example and saying, don't you understand, your spiritual life is greater than the things that we pursue after. So stop pursuing after those things. I've never seen money actually bring comfort. I've never seen things actually bring comfort. But yet, these are the things we are anxious about and concerned about. And Jesus said, we ought not to. Do you realize how valuable you are? You know, it's incredible to me. It's incredible to me. We have no idea how valuable things are. None of us do. You know how I know that? Every now and then I'll watch The Price is Right. Right? Every now and then I'll watch The Price is Right. And every now and then I'd watch The Antique Roadshow. And it dawned on me that we have no clue how valuable things are. You, you'd see someone on the prices right say, you know, okay, all these things cost $12,000. And they said, ah, actually, you're wrong. They cost $150,000. And you're like, how can this person be so off? Or, or on the Antique Roadshow, you know, they'd bring a, a uh, uh, someone says, hey, I bought this at, at a yard sale for $20, a painting. Next thing you know, it's a Picasso, and it's worth millions. And you're like, what is wrong with these people? They have no idea how much things cost. Do you, do you understand? We have no idea how much our lives cost and how valuable you are to God. We have no idea. But Paul gives us some idea. He says this. He says, if you want to understand your value, look at the cross. Romans 8 says this, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How can he not with him freely give us all things? Notice again the argument from the greater to the lesser. You are so valuable to God that he gave that which was most valuable to him, Jesus Christ, on the cross for you. That's how valuable you are. And one of the things that that just pains me about our society is to see people walking around not knowing how much they are valued and loved by their heavenly father. And how do I know that? Because they chase things around instead of chasing and pursuing a relationship with the Lord. And Jesus says, be careful. Is not life more than food? Is not your life? And your body more than food? Isn't your soul more important to put its trust in God than anything else? It's an argument for the greater to the lesser. Now quickly, let's look at the next argument, the argument from the lesser to the greater. Notice verse number 26. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. Now I know some of you are singing the song. If you were here this week, you know exactly what I mean. You know, there's not a day that goes by that I don't sing that song. Look at the birds of the air. (laughs) But that's what Jesus tells us to do. He's making an argument for the lesser to greater. And, And the beauty of this argument is that it's so simplistic. Everyone could understand. You don't have to have a background in philosophy. You don't have to have a background in in ethics. Immediately, you can see the full import here. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into birds, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of value than they? He's saying that if Jesus, if God takes the time to feed the birds, if God takes the time to feed, to clothe the lilies in, in such beautiful way, Why do you think he's not going to provide for you? Let me bring it a little closer to home. Uh, uh, As many of you know, I have three dogs against my will. Um, I I don't even want one dog. I'm just being honest. I'm I'm not anti-dog. I'm just not pro-dog. 
Um, and and every, every single month, I lament about the amount of money we spend on our dog. I, I pull out the budget, and I see a line item for our dog. They get food. Uh, they, they get a line item for, for food and for health care, for grooming. I mean, I mean, our dogs are, are more taken care of than me. <laughs> I, 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 that is no exaggeration. <laughs> right? I, I, and and I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not bitter about that. I'm just saying that's the reality. <laughs> that's, the, that's the reality, right? And, and now I, I tell you that, and, and I bet you, as I told you that, here's what you didn't say. You didn't say, I wonder if there's a line item for his clothing. Nobody said that. See, I, I tell you that I have a line item for my dog, and I do, and they're well fed. All they do is lounge around all day. They do nothing. If you come in my house, they'll lick you to death. I, you know, I often say, bite someone, like use you know, like, I have some function in my home other than taking up space and putting dog hair everywhere. It's like, a, it's like a spice in our home. If you come to our home to eat, you might find dog hair in the food because it's everywhere. <laughs> now, listen, none of you said, when I told you that, none of you said, I wonder. I wonder if Dennis takes care of his children. Of course I do. Why, why do I take care of my children? Because my children are more important than the dog. Of course, the line item for my children is larger because I love them more. And what Jesus is saying here is if, if he provides for the birds in abundance, if he provides for the lilies in abundance, these things are, are ephemeral, temporal, would he not provide for you? Do, do you know there, there are two things that the Bible tells us that will last forever? One of them is God's word. And who's the other one? You. You. And Jesus is saying here that he promises. You can look, you can look at the birds. You can look at the lilies. And you could be reminded that he is more than capable to provide for you. You might be sitting here and you might say, Pastor Dennis, I'm not sure if that's the case. Well, try him. Try him. He never lets us down. David says, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And you know that's the case. I remember um, when Teresa and I first went to Mississippi we were pregnant with Madison. I had no job, and I just started seminary. Uh, women, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, you know, that's, that's an extreme circumstance. But I can tell you something. We never went hungry. Madison never lacked for formula. Because our God provides. He provides. That's the power behind these verses. He provides. Now, the very last argument that Jesus gives is an argument from futility to certainty. Futility to certainty. Look with me at verse number 27. He says, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? You know what's interesting to me? A, a few years ago, well, several years ago, actually, several years ago, there was somebody running as a transhumanist. Do you, do you know what a transhumanist is? It's somebody who is trying to live forever. And so apparently these are people that think that they can download our consciousness to a machine or they can freeze us and thaw us out later. There, there's a whole platform for it. Look it up. It's called transhumanism. Th there are people who are anxious about their life. They want to live longer. And you know what the irony is? If you are anxious about living longer, you know what happens? You end up dying sooner. 
That's the point that Jesus is saying here. Which of us, and, and again, he's talking about the bad form of anxiety. He says, how many of you, if you're anxious about expanding your life, will actually be able to expand it? It's counterintuitive. It's, it's futile. And notice, again, the futility in verse number 31. It says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? These are questions. You know, my children ask me questions all the time. Yesterday, I was sitting down. And somebody came and said, Daddy, what are we going to eat? I said, there's food in the fridge. And then a few hours later, they came and they said, Daddy, what are we going to eat? I said, my goodness, you just ate two hours ago. But there's food in the fridge. My children are always asking me, Daddy, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Thankfully, they have a father who they can ask that to and actually gives them an answer. Jesus' point in this passage is this. Imagine if your child was at home starving with nothing to eat, nothing to drink, and no one to ask these questions to. Do you think they would be panicked? Absolutely they would. That's why he says here, what shall we what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. The, the, the point that he's making here is that Gentiles don't have a heavenly father. They're not in relationship to God. And therefore, they ask these questions, and they have no one to go to. And so they have to rely on themselves, and that is utterly futile. Jesus is saying if you are in covenant with him, and relationship with him is entirely appropriate to go to him and ask these questions because he alone has the ability to answer them. You know, I would never leave my children home without food or drink and go missing for a week. Tempted at times, but never do it. Never, never do it because that would be child abuse. You know, God doesn't practice cosmic child abuse. He loves you. And he will provide for you. Now, how do we have that certainty? Notice verse number 33. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, the order is important. The order is important. He says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. He's saying prioritize spiritual things, Jesus says. Now, you might say, well, that's all fine for Jesus. Jesus could do that, but pastor, I don't know if I can do that. Let me me tell you something. Jesus can say this because he lived this reality every day. Do you know that? He lived this reality every day. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 8, 20, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man does not have uh, anywhere to lay his head. Every day Jesus lived this reality. We often forget that there are only two times in the Bible Jesus provided miraculously for himself and for others. The rest of the times he had to uh, rely on God's providence. But yet Jesus didn't die of thirst. He didn't die of food. Because he lacked food. He didn't die because he was exposed to the elements. Oh no, he died on the cross. And and him dying on the cross, by the way, was him prioritizing the kingdom of heaven over following these things. Do you ever wonder why the devil couldn't get him to make stones into bread? Or to sin for that matter? Because Jesus prioritized his father's kingdom. And yet, even in the wilderness, he didn't die because his father provided for him. You might be in the wilderness today. But remember, you have a heavenly father that prioritized your spiritual well-being by denying his physical well-being. That's the gospel. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that glorious? I love the fact that Jesus doesn't just say things. 
that he didn't experience. He doesn't tell us to do things that he didn't do himself. Jesus prioritized the kingdom of God and its righteousness so that it would be added to us. And now we as his people are called to do the exact same. And so next time you're tempted to be swept away by the bad form of anxiety, remember your Savior. He might never take it away, but he gives you a greater reason to continue, and that is him. That's him. I'll end with one final story. There's a, uh, most of you know Frank Sinatra. Um, his, his daughter, you might not know this, but his daughter wrote a book. It says, My Father's Child. And, and in the book, she talks about at the end of his life, at the very end of his life, he started to do these shows. And, and, and he was old, but the shows were horrible. In, in fact, I, I'm not just saying that. It's actually true. I, I, I remember uh, my mother loved Frank Sinatra. Um, and, and so I, I remember listening to some of his older stuff, and it was bad. He forgot lines. It, it was awful. And in the book, his daughter says, um, his daughter says, you know, I tried to convince dad to stop doing the shows because he was in poor health. He was in his 80s forgetting lines, but he just wouldn't. And, and one of the things that dad kept saying over and over again is he said, I have to make more money. I have to make more money so I could leave it behind and take care of everyone. That's what, what obsessed him, the man who always did things his way. To the very end, wanted to do it his way by providing for his family. And at the very end, his legacy, to some degree, was tarnished. Because as he tried to do it his way, he failed miserably. Hey, can I tell you, let, stop doing things your way. You have a heavenly father. You don't have to figure it out on your own. Go to him. Pray to him. Rest in him. He will provide all your need. Father, uh, we thank you that you are our heavenly father. <sighs> what a glorious reality. I'm thankful that I don't have to do it my way. I'm thankful that none of us have to do it our way. I'm thankful that we get to do it your way. Help us to prioritize kingdom reality and trust that you will provide all that we need. In Jesus' name, amen.